It's Monday, March 30th. My goodness, how time flies. And welcome to the practicing Jew and the wandering Jew. Rabbi Levi Kunin is the practicing Jew. And I, Michael E. Gerber, am the wandering Jew. And I trust you've enjoyed our conversations to this point in time as scattered as they might have been from one post to the other post. We'll try to keep on target, if you will, so that Rabbi Conan can share with you who he is and what it means to be a practicing Jew. And I can share with you who I am and what it means to be a wandering Jew. And over the time that we're gonna be spending together, our intent is to bring those two poles, you might say, closer and closer and closer and closer to where they become one. And that is Baruch Hashem, both of our hopes, both of our dreams, both of our visions, our purposes, and our missions to become one, to align ourselves in this global reality with our one God, with Hashem. So welcome, Levi. How are you today? Thank God. Good to see you. Good to be here. Thank you. So let's begin our conversation where we left off. Um, but where we left off at the beginning of this, not where we left off yesterday, because we keep on leaving off someplace I never expected we would leave off. And because we're doing this in such a narrow window, only 20 minutes, um, it's really important that we try to stay on track. I try to do that, but the track keeps on changing. <laughs> and I guess that's the nature of life. So lady, please, the last conversation we had about you as the practicing Jew was at a basketball game where you had to look away when the cheerleaders came on. Do you remember that? You're really sticking to that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the point where we departed. And we began with your story, your life story, what it means to be a practicing Jew. And we walked through a period of time in your young life and it stopped and we went away from it. And I want to get back to it so that okay. everybody listening to us can share what it means to be you. So just, I, I'm gonna go right to it. Just two things I wanna bring up as a preface. Number one, someone, a good friend of mine who watched part of our show uh, pointed out to me that we're all practicing, that even the wandering Jew is also a practicing Jew in their own way. So I wanted to bring that up, you know? It's not meant to, to uh, underestimate that power. Number two, in the last few days, the narrative of what it means to be an observant Jew has been hijacked to some degree by a show that's called Unorthodox, which tells a very, very different story of being brought up as an observant practicing Jew. And the reason why I bring that up here is because my story is radically different from people who grew up in neighborhoods such as Williamsburg, where their interaction with the outside society was very minimal. And the way in which many of them were, the way, in, sorry, the way in which many of them were raised was with great fear and of being punished by God for doing something that they shouldn't be doing. That was not the way I was raised. My mother, may she be blessed and be gesund. From a very young age, every night before we went to sleep, we were told stories of great people, great men and women throughout history. And in the stories, we would hear about the distinction between who we are as our holy self and who we are as our lower self. They weren't necessarily, necessarily said in that context, 
but it was within that context that I'm back at that basketball game. In other words, whatever we see and whatever we hear comes into our consciousness. And as very young children, we are guided to protect it so that our higher self gets to be the governing self and not the opposite. So the example I gave you as an example was, yes, we did at times go to events such as basketball games, etc. But we also felt it wasn't for us to be looking in certain parts of, the, of what was taking place because it was inconsistent with how our mother has raised us. And uh, so, yes, it was a restriction, but it wasn't, it, it, when I, I'm, used, I'm saying it, I'm saying it wasn't, it wasn't religious dogma. That's not what I grew up with. I didn't grow up with religious dogma. I grew up with a, a, a very, very a powerful sense of what it means to be souls living in a temporary vehicle, which we refer to as our bodies, and what it is that we get to do to ascend higher and higher and get deeper and deeper in our connection with Hashem. So, as a... That, go ahead, you want to, want to ask something? That, that's lovely, Levi. Um, that's lovely, because it's the first you've actually spoken about um, your mother. <laughs> what are you doing on the screen, Levi? <laughs> I'm trying to speak. The speaker went off, so I, I wasn't hearing you. Now I could hear you. It was the first. It was the first you've ever spoken of your mother, and um, in fact, you really haven't spoken about your father. And your mother and your father had immense influence upon you and your brothers and sisters as you were being raised from the very beginning. So it was not just, in quotes, your um, Jewish heritage. It was your Jewish relationship with your father and your mother that formed the way you were raised, um, not in dogma, as you just said, but in a living experience of how they were being who they were. And that had an extraordinary impact upon you. And so if you would please, now I'm listening to the story, just as our guests are, and I'm interpreting, if you will, your message as I, presume our guests are wanting to know more about that, about your mother, about your father. Uh, can you share that with us? Yes, so my mother, <clears throat> I'll start with my mother. My mother was born to her parents, her mother, when they were fleeing Russia during the time of the war. They had, she has several older sisters, and my grandfather and grandmother were very observant, Torah observant Jews. And they miraculously were able to flee Russia and eventually made it to America. In how, how were they miraculously able to flee they, Russia? They were actually, they had fake passports. They were not allowed to leave officially. And actually, on the train, they were on the very back of the train where they were hiding in a cargo train. And when the Russian intelligence came onto the train, they caught half of the people there. They, the other half, which included my grandparents, they did not catch. So I see that's kind of miraculous, you know, <laughs> if you think about it. And the, the miracles don't end there. When my grandmother was giving birth to my mother, she was in Austria, Vienna, Austria, which was, of course, the birthplace of you know who. And the people there, the anti-Semites in the hospital, would refuse to help my grandmother. And it was, it was very dangerous because my mother was breech. And she fainted on the table because of pain. Her father, who, her grandfather, who was a great rabbi, or her father, I'm not remembering if her father or grandfather came, her father came to her in a, in like a, suddenly in a dream 
And her father said, don't worry, someone's coming to help you. And someone came that actually, this is my grandmother's story. I heard since I'm a child, someone came, they had a beard, came and delivered my mother. And then after everything was okay, my grandmother wanted to know who was it that came, which doctor was it. And no one knew who she was talking about. So that's the other miraculous part of it all. My mother was told by her mother that it was Elijah the prophet that delivered her. Who knows? But that's the story I grew up with. And my, my grandparents didn't speak English at all. I struggled tremendously when they arrived in America. But they maintained their observance of Judaism to the umph degree. In fact, my grandfather was asked to come to be uh, someone who works in the kosher business in Detroit. And he found out that they were using his stamp that shows that he certified things to make it that he did, which he didn't use, he meaning they stole his stamp, the people that he worked for. So he quit and he packed his bags and went back to New York. So he, despite the fact that he had no money, you know, it was, it was absolutely not an option for him to be in a situation where people will be eating things that are not kosher with his stamp on it. And uh, he felt the, the immediate need to leave. So I, I share that story because that's the level, the contrast from one hand, all the pain and suffering, um, the people, the many, many, many observant Jews when they left Europe, they came here, they were very, very upset about the Holocaust, of course, understandably. Many of them felt uh, neglected by God and just gave up their Torah observance. But that was not the story of my grandparents. Mm. My grandparents, the, despite all of the pain and suffering that they endured during that time, somehow or another, they kept their Yiddishkeit, not just keeping it, but really deeply inspired, you know, with, uh, with all the great stories that my mother told me about her father and about his joy of Yiddishkeit that he brought to his family. And that's despite the fact that they were completely broke almost all the time, but they were never poor because my mother never felt poor. She felt completely blessed by the environment and the home that she was raised in. My father was born in the Bronx. His grandfather and his great-grandfather and his great-grandfather were all Hasidim, very observant Jews. My father's mother lost all of her siblings in the Holocaust. She married my grandfather, who at the time was an observant Jew, but he wasn't like a rabbi or anything. And that's where my, my father's story, for the first 17 years of his life, he went to public school. He did not go to the yeshiva. And the reason why my grandmother, although she was observant in Torah, she didn't send him to the yeshiva because she was very, very, very disheartened by what she was witnessing, the type of education that was going on. Understandably, these were people who were Holocaust survivors that were dealing with so much trauma. And where she went to, whatever her experience was, she felt that that was being taken out on the children. So she decided to be the teacher of their Yiddish guide until when they turned 17, my, my, my father turned 17, his brother was a year or two older than him. They were advised by the Rebbe to go to the Chabad school and that's how my father uh, became a Hasid of the Rebbe. I think I spoke too much already. <clears throat> no, I think you... But, it, but I feel like we're talking Talking so much about me, I want to hear about you. <laughs> you began to tell us a story which I was quite riveted on. Um, it's, it's a story that was um, given to you by your mother and your father, um, shared with you by your mother and your father, shared with all of your brothers and sisters by your mother and father, 
um, very, very early on in your life as I'm listening to it. And unfortunately, I have none of that in my life. Indeed, I have no memory of my mother or my father whatsoever in my early life. They didn't share their life with us. Um, it was though my life and their life were separate lives as opposed to your life and your parents' life and your siblings' lives were um, one life. I say that that's my interpretation of what you're sharing. Um, it's so completely different from my experience growing up. And it's also um, astonishing to me, um, and I'm saying that to all of our guests and to you, Levy, that my memory has no pictures, no true experience of being alive in all those years I grew up. It's like I wasn't even there. And it's so different from what you're describing because what I'm hearing from you is that you were completely there. And please, I don't want to misinterpret it. I'm just giving everybody my impression of your story as you're sharing it. You're sharing a story that you experienced, not that you remember. And to me, it's quite a different thing. You're sharing a story that you experienced as you were living it, not that you remember as I'm asking you to recall it. That that experience is coming from within you as you experienced it, as opposed to outside of you as you remember it. I have none of that. And I have none of that in my early life. And indeed, I had none of that in my entire life. My experiences being as vivid as they were when I was there are impossible to relate to when I'm here. And that may speak volumes about me as a wandering Jew, but it may speak volumes about me simply as Michael E. Gerber. I don't know which, but as I listen to you, I'm feeling that huge gap, that huge difference between your experience when you grew up and I must say your experience right now as compared to mine. Would you like to reflect on that? <clears throat> yes, I, it's, uh, it's interesting because I recall your story, a part of your story with your saxophone and you learning the saxophone at a young age. And I feel to, it just comes to me because I feel like that experience of when you had the joy, when the joy was alive, to me, that's a, a, a certain type of feeling that people who enjoy music get to have when they're in the presence of music. But music is one level of such an experience. And, and as you share and you say the words that you just said, I feel that I was blessed to have music playing on different levels. And I feel that to be the case even today as, you know, it's terrible news coming out of New York and what's happening over there, the death rate. And who knows where and how this is going to 
continue to hit our country, God forbid. And one has every reason to be in a state of fear and trepidation. And from one hand, we need to be. We need to see how temporary our lives are and how little control we have. And at the same time, it's the music of Yiddishkeit that I believe gives us the greatest strength to be present in these times in a more impactful, more joyous way. Because what and who gains from fear? And what's it going to help anybody? I didn't want to stop you, Levy, um, but believe it or not, we're well over our 20 minutes. <laughs> Can you believe that? We're well over our 20 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Levy Kuhn. <laughs> It's impossible to do this in 20 minutes because I can see I'm caught up in the conversation and I can see that my I want to persist with it, continue with it, because there's so much more to speak about. But our time is up. Our time is up. So I'm going to say... I'm going to say to every single one of you listening to us today on this Monday that we've run out of time. We've gone over time. And I love you, Levi Kunin. And give love my you. absolute clear love to your parents, to your wife, to your lovely, beautiful children. I am so connected to you right now. Thank you for being here with me.